After former Colorado Governor John Hickenlooper left the presidential primary, he announced his bid to unseat Senator Cory Gardner. But his progressive primary challenger, Andrew Romanoff, is right on Hickenlooper's heels. Indeed, Romanoff has been closing the polling gap and doing so quite quickly with a poll commissioned by the Romanoff campaign showing him only 12 points behind now. Back in an October internal poll, he was 49 points behind, so he's made up a lot of ground. Andrew Romanoff joins us now via Skype to talk about his campaign. Great to see you. Thank you very much. How are you doing? Good to see you, Andrew. Very good. Um, so we had you on before. Just give us a little bit of an update on the campaign and why the polling is closing uh, so quickly here down the stretch. Well, I'd like to think it's because of my debate performance, my team, which is doing a fantastic job, uh, the agenda that we're laying out, a bold progressive call for climate action and health care for all, an economy that works for everyone. Uh, but in fairness, I have to give a little bit of credit to my opponent who defied a subpoena, broke the law, got held in contempt, uh, and has, uh, as I think the AP put it, turned into a hot mess. <laughs> yeah, we were talking about that earlier on the show. I think one of his own advisors Actually, yeah, it was said one of his that, own right? advisors who's like, this is a hot mess of a campaign. And yet, um, Andrew, we've seen a pretty concerted effort here in Washington to try and save Hick and Lucas campaign, despite the fact that it's an open primary. Senator Elizabeth Warren endorsed um, endorsed John Hickenlooper. I think Cory Booker did as well. What do you make of that? You're a progressive in the race, and you see a progressives like Elizabeth Warren endorse Hickenlooper. Yeah, you know, I think it's some example that Washington is trying to salvage his campaign. It's true, we don't have endorsements from D.C. We do have about 400 county commissioners and mayors and school board members and city council members and legislators who've endorsed my campaign. So it's turning into a contest between Colorado and Washington. But you can't just buy this nomination. And it strikes me, too, that if you want to beat Cory Gardner, you can't keep handing him ammunition. So I think we've got a better chance to win. We'll find out on June 30th. People are voting now. A lot of folks have gone on to AndrewRomanoff.com. In fact, we raised twice as much money in this quarter as any other quarter since we started a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. And Andrew, I think that electability case is really key because people may prefer you on the issues, but they're worried they need a more centrist candidate in order to um, take what is a critical and one of the most up for grad Senate seats in the entire country. Why do you think that you're the more electable candidate? Well, I think the best way to beat Cory Gardner is to present a clear alternative. I mean, you know this, that Republicans aren't going to pull their punches or reward our timidity. And this is no time for timidity. They're going to demonize every single Democrat, no matter whether you stand for Medicare for all, as I do, or whether you stood for Medicare itself. I mean, Harry Truman was proposing national health insurance in 1945, and he got hit by the same attacks. So I think I'll take Sam Rayburn's advice. He said, you should always tell the truth because it's easier to remember. <laughs> so, Andrew, I mean, broadly, your campaign, it was seen as underdog in the shot. But could you explain, I think the last time we had you on, you won a convention or you know, it was it's a bit complicated in Colorado. But just explain to the audience kind of how your campaign has been an upsurge now for months now. Yeah, you're right. So Colorado has a very complicated path to the Democratic nomination and the Republican nomination, for that matter. Although Cory Gardner doesn't have any challengers on that side. He has embraced Donald Trump so tightly that he held off any primary. So in Colorado, we have a caucus, which I won by almost a two to one margin over Mr. Hickenlooper. That leads to a county assembly, a set of those across the state, which I also won, a state convention, as you mentioned, which we took with about 90% of the vote. All of that just gets you on the ballot. Uh, and the ballot in this case is a universal mail-in ballot. They, the ballots went out earlier this month. They're due on June 30th. There are about 2.4 million registered Democrats and unaffiliated voters who are receiving those ballots and have a chance to participate. It's worth pointing out in the presidential primary in March in Colorado, Bernie Sanders won. In fact, if you add Senator Sanders' votes to Senator Warren's votes, you'll find a majority of the Democrats and unaffiliated voters in Colorado picked the progressive candidates. Hmm. Yeah, that is a very interesting note. I mean, this is an open primary, right? There is an incumbent, a Democratic incumbent. You're not going up against one of their own. Why does the DSCC even get involved in something like this? And why are they going so hard in for Hickenlooper? That is the right question, Crystal. And obviously, it's a question better put to Senator Schumer. I'm sure you're having him on your show next. Uh, look, uh, I think <laughs> he hasn't gotten back to us yet, well, Andrew. It's an open invitation. <laughs> yeah, look, uh, he's, it's not you. He's not that into me either. Uh, but I think it's pretty clear that our candidacy, like the candidacies of so many other progressives across the country, represents a threat to the status quo. If you are the Democratic or Republican establishment, I don't have to tell you this, and you rely on the contributions that come from the fossil fuel industry, the drug companies, 
the insurance companies. You certainly don't want Democrats who are going to bite the hands that are feeding you. So uh, I'm comfortable uh, standing up to my own party because I think they're wrong on these issues. They are subsidized by the fossil fuel industry. They oppose the Green New Deal. Uh, they oppose Medicare for all. I'm talking about the the leadership of the Democratic Party in Washington, not the majority of the public. And I guess that's the most important thing to me. Uh, mm. You've seen surveys where the vast majority of the American people support universal single payer health care, bold climate action, the agenda we're running on. Yeah. Well, and, and on the Warren endorsement, if we could just put her tweet up explaining why she, as someone who at least claims to be a progressive, is backing John Hickenlooper, who really is anything but... She cites that he's taken on the NRA, invested in wind and solar renewable energy to confront the climate crisis, and fought tooth and nail to protect the right to choose. On that energy piece in particular, I mean, that seemed to me particularly galling, given some of his record on climate and your, you know, how different you are in the way that you think about and approach those issues. You're right, uh, and she's wrong. Uh, the truth is, uh, John Hickenlooper sued communities that tried to restrict fracking, literally drank the fracking fluid, not just a metaphor, uh, just a bad idea. He opposes the Green New Deal. He takes money, just like Cory Gardner, from the fossil fuel industry. Uh, and it strikes me, if you want to replace Cory Gardner, the best way to do that is to nominate a climate champion. All right, Andrew, wow. great to see you. Thank you so much. We'll be paying attention. Good luck. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you, Thank you both very much. Next on Rising, some Democrats are saying Bernie Sanders still hasn't done enough to support Joe Biden's presidential primary, uh, presidential bid. Why some are making that argument when Rising returns.